Hi, all. It's now December the 12th. I've been unable to do anything mental for months because of my move uh, to a new home, which uh, derails everything, uh, the ability to think in any clear way. But now I'm back to uh, turning my attention to things that really matter to me. And I'd like to start by sharing my musings on the concept of eudaimonia. As some of you know, this is the name of my role-playing blog, uh, Eudaimonic Geekery. It's an important topic, uh, but to get into this, I've got to give a quick overview of the rise of this concept from ancient Greece. The word eudaimonia comes from the ancient Greek good diamond. A diamond uh, was a spirit. It's where we get the word demon. The poor modern English translation for eudaimonia is happiness, which really misses the mark. A far better translation is um, truly flourishing, being led by the good diamond towards a thriving, fulfilling life. So how do we find eudaimonia? Well, these Greeks effectively addressed the question by asking, what is each creature's special distinguishing characteristic? What can creature X do in a way that no other creature can? What's most distinctive about a crow versus a wolf versus a snake that maximizing the distinguishing elements leads to its optimal flourishing in life? Starting with the most general of questions like crows, surely this has something to do with flight or wolves, surely this is something to do with hunting, or snakes, something stealth or hiding related. So when they zoomed in on humans, the question was the same. What distinguishing feature exists in humans that, when honed to perfection, maximizes them? Of course, the Greek philosophers argued about it, but to save time, the best answer was rationality for humans can exceed all other animals in rational capacity and discourse. You just wouldn't know it by looking at the 21st century. So once we decide on what the eudaimonia is for humans, we then ask, how is this eudaimonia reached? The best overarching answer, again quickly, came with a concept of arete, best translated as excellence. By honing and pushing excellence in our special distinguishing characteristics, for example, humans and, um, and reason, we move closer to eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is an applicable paradigm, not just to each species, but to all activities. For example, among physical sports, we can find the distinguishing feature setting it apart from all other sports. Maximizing that leads to the ideal version of that sport. For example, in basketball or soccer, football to the rest of the world, cardio and leanness of the players are vital elements, while in American football, uh, strength and tackling may be said are vital. This is the process of honing uh, required in order to find eudaimonia for each activity. As the Greeks had pointed out, crows are not the same as wolves, and they're not the same as snakes, and so forth. And to find the eudaimonia for each, we delve into what their unique strengths are to maximize their lives. Okay, so what's all of this got to do with role-playing games? We approach it in the same manner, by finding the most important features that distinguish it from all other games in the ballpark. This gets complicated for a few reasons, but I think the best place to start is by first comparing role-playing with its constituent parts. As I've said, role-playing games are chimeras, the melding of established previous games, miniature wargaming, and make-believe. So what are their salient distinguishing properties? For wargaming, surely it's maximum strategy using rules manipulation, understanding statistics and chance, and so forth. For make-believe, it's free-flowing, unfettered imagination, strong narrative, and things which allow our minds and emotions to swim in different settings and worlds and interacting with characters. The eudaimonia for these two activities is surely not the same. 
Role-playing games merge these two activities and others into a new creature. So how do we find its eudaimonia? And for a host of reasons, here is where finding the eudaimonia of role-playing games gets really messy. Primarily, this is because finding any two role-playing game chimeras, which composed of the same amounts of the old stuff, wargaming and make-believe, is really unlikely. Further, most gamers have not spent the time critiquing what they have and what they want, and so they can't even begin to have clarity on the game that they're playing. Lacking this clarity is why the pat answers of, oh, just have fun, or it's just a game, are so common and so unhelpful for those who crave something more. We can get this clarity, but we have to do the work. It's far more complicated here than in physical sports. If we just look at, say, basketball versus soccer, we can see a lot of overlap, a lot of similarities, like get the ball over there into that thing or prevent the ball from getting here into this thing. Of course, you know, those two games have numerous differences at work, but how much more complicated are role-playing games? We have so many disparate elements and goals at work, far more than win in the case of these ball games. So we have to address specifics like how wargamey is your role-playing game? How are charts and rules and um, manipulation of numbers, math, and so forth um, in the minds of the players as the game is going on? Or how novel-esque are you trying to be? Do you just play lip service to the mechanics elements? Are you really just doing a kind of formless improv theater in your role-playing games? Only as we start zooming in on the specific role-playing games that we want can we finally begin to pursue its eudaimonia. But I can tell you my own conclusions. The ideal role-playing game chimera is melding in the foundational elements like wargaming and make-believe in such a way that the players can feel like they've entered into a different setting, into a different world as real three-dimensional people. The mechanics part of this chimera gives the laws of nature to this other world so that the players have objective boundaries in rules for their characters' lives. But these mechanics are never the focus for me. They are opaque, they're under the hood, for that would interfere with the mental immersion which the players hunger for. So I believe that my Apex role-playing game is one that allows the most powerful other world immersion for the players, where they inhabit different characters and places. They live and act in these worlds with free will, but they're bound by the laws of nature, the mechanics, which are invisible to them. This is the specific chimera of role-playing games for me. This experience we want is a special one that can only happen within role-playing games. That is, miniature wargaming cannot do this because its own strength, its own eudaimonia, is in the realm of pure strategy, knowing and manipulating algorithms and having a good grasp of statistics. The make-believe component can't do it either with novels or storytelling, because those activities lack a solid structure. They lack the boundaries of a system which adjudicate cause and effect. Okay, so taking a long time to finally arrive, my answer for the role-playing game eudaimonia is powerful otherworld immersion. Role-playing games can accomplish what I want as no other activity can. It's something that's often couched in terms like simulationism or perhaps emulationism or even just realism. Only a role-playing game can do this, and this is where it can truly flourish. As with all other instances, once we pinpoint something's eudaimonic state, we then ask, how can we strengthen it? How can we move towards eudaimonia? The answer, as the Greeks taught us, is arete which I'll address in my next episode.
So thanks for listening. I hope you'll enjoy this and share it and chime in with your comments. And I'll see you soon.